My name is Sean Jensen. Uh, I am the pastor here at Authentic Church. One of the pastors here, we have a handful that just do an amazing job. And we've been in a series that we're calling The Power of Prayer. And, uh, and we are in episode three. So if you're like me and you like to binge watch shows right now, currently we're watching the show called Fringe. I know it's outdated, but it's great. And, uh, and we're in episode three of this series, and I hope it's been encouraging to you. And we've been prioritizing prayer and learning the pattern of prayer and uh, we're currently in a 10 days of prayer and fasting as a church, and it's no doubt that God is delivering people during this time. Well, we're going to look in James, so if this is your first time, we're glad you're here. We're going to look at the verse that started us two weeks ago. You can binge watch on YouTube all of these messages, and this is what it said, and we talked about a couple weeks ago, and I'll catch you up. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. And then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. Now, if you're here and you might be skeptical in your faith and you don't know what to think about someone praying and droughts happening, you can actually go look up an account that happened thousands of years ago of a famine that took place over this land the same amount of time that they said the prophet Elijah prayed for this. It's pretty cool to even see, but also God does things that we can't understand sometimes. I think if we're always trying to understand him, we won't ever know. But based on the scripture, we learned two things a couple weeks ago, right? Prayer does what? Prayer is powerful and it creates results. And so we talked about how prayer changes things, but we are revisiting this because we learned about this guy named Elijah who, listen, was a super prophet. Like, yeah, of course he prayed and rain happened. He's a super prophet that God used to speak to his people in Israel. But what I love about James is he wants to bring the super prophet down to our level. He says he's as human as you are, aka if God did it through Elijah, he can do it through you too. What I love about this scripture is that so many times we see people on stage and we see people like do worship and like, oh, they're just like, they're like the Jedis of this thing. And, and James wants to remind you, no one's a Jedi. If they can pray, you can pray. If they see results, you can see results. If Elijah prayed for the rain to stop, you can pray for someone to be healed and see the power of God work in your life. Of course, we're not praying for the rain to stop for three years. There was a purpose on why God did that. Okay, so we're going to pray the purposes and plans of God. We can't be like, well, I prayed for three years that it wouldn't rain. Why? Just to see. Well, God's got a purpose and plan, and we got to pray with that plan. So we're going to continue on with Elijah, and we're going to look at him a little bit more and what happened. I, I touched on him a little bit last week, and also at last year we did a series called In a Drought. Remember? Because we said that this world might be going in drought, but the church will remain in abundance. I hope you're hanging on to that because it's getting crazy out there. You saw your taxes go up. You saw inflation go up. Listen, the, the economy in the church is going great. God's got this thing. And, uh, and so we touched on this exact scripture about praying through the drought, but I think we need to exhaust a little bit more from this that we can learn today as well. So up until this moment, let me just help you. If you were here last week, if not, I'll catch you up. Last week, we talked about Elijah, how it has not, pray, it has not rained for three years, and he had this showdown on the mountain, Mount Carmel, and they had like 450 prophets of Baal up there, and he said, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray all day. We're going to pray that our God would rain fire down on this altar, and he told the prophets of Baal, you go ahead and do it first, and then we'll see if your God answers, and I'll do it, the one true God, and see if he answers, and whoever answers is the one true God, right? We talked about that last week, and we've learned that the prophets of Baal literally babbled on all day, and nothing happened. They were cutting themselves. They were going, hey, God, are you up there? Because Baal's not alive. It's not real. And, and a lot of times we can spend our whole life trying to entertain a God who's not there. And, uh, and Elijah shows up, remember? And he says a prayer. It's only three sentences long. And right after those three sentences, whoo, fire comes down just like that on his first try. Boom, God shows up. Well, after this moment, now Elijah's going to pray for rain. So he's on Mount Carmel, and this is what happens in this moment. Then Elijah said to Ahab, that's the king of Israel at the time. He was wicked. So go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. So Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, or Caramel for my bougie people, and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. Then he said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Finally, the seventh time, his servant told him, I see a little cloud about the size of Pastor Sean's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, 
Hurry, I've heard people say it all the time. Like, we saw you online, and then we met you in the lobby. You're a lot shorter than what we expected. <laughs> like, thank you. We're glad you're here. <laughs> hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. And soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm, and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Now, I don't know before we pray in the moment. Um, I don't know if you noticed this, the contrast between Mount Carmel with the 450 prophets of Baal and the contrast for this moment of praying for rain. But it was easier for Elijah to pray for fire down from heaven than it was what the sky was naturally supposed to bring down from heaven. Do you notice this? It was easier for Elijah to pray for fire to consume an altar than rain to wash the land. Elijah prayed one time, fire came down, but it took seven times for the rain to happen. Have you ever in your life prayed for something and nothing happened? Let me, let me go deeper. Have you ever prayed for something in your life and God shows up quickly, but then you pray for something completely different and you're still waiting? Elijah prays for fire, okay, but it takes him seven times to pray for rain. If you're writing notes, this is the name of the message and the thought today. When I pray and nothing happens. When I pray and nothing happens. I know some people are there and this might be a sensitive topic, but I believe God's going to speak to us today and what we can do. Now, I want to be very clear. These three things I'm going to share with you does not mean it's going to happen today. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that these are principles, not that we just see Elijah do in this moment, but what Jesus taught. And I believe it's going to help you when you're waiting. I believe it's going to help you and give you hope to hopefully pray again and see what God wants to do in your heart. So if you have prayed and see nothing, or you've prayed for one person and you see the air prayer or you see everybody else's answer prayer, God, they've only been coming for one week. I've been serving for five years. And you answer their prayer, right? And I'm still waiting on mine. That's for you. This is for you today. I've been there so many times. Can I just give you a few things real quick that we see from this scripture? The first thing is this, try fasting. Try fasting. Like, Sean, we're in the middle of 10 days of prayer and fasting. We get it. We get the idea. We know. But the truth is, is the 10 days of prayer and fasting is a great way to start the year because we believe how we start is how we finish, and we want to start strong, and we do that as a church. We've done it since we've started, and we love it. Uh, but the truth is, and by the way, we're doing 10 days. We used to do 21 days. We're, we're trying to help you take that step of faith, all right? So, like, 10 days, I can do that. 21, I'm out. <laughs> like, but the truth is, is a lot of people think this is just earmarked for the beginning of the year, but fasting is actually a lifestyle for the follower of Jesus. It was never meant just to do in January. It was supposed to do when you find yourself in tough times and in tough situations. It's actually a spiritual discipline that, that God wants to give you. If you're new to church, we're so glad you're here. We don't want you to feel like this stuff's above your head, but if you're new to church, fasting is the biblical concept of abstaining from physical food while replacing it with spiritual food a.k.a. prayer and God's word. And so we're in a season where people are doing liquid diets right now. We have people who have turned off other foods, people doing the Daniel fast. And instead, when they have hunger pains, instead of turning to another Oreo or turning to another burger, gosh, that sounds so good, they actually say, I'm going to pray and fill this space with God's presence. And we do this. And why? Because this world, our stomachs are our God. Our desires control us. You do you, boo-boo. You live your best truth. And we allow our desires to control us. So what does fasting do? It reminds us that Jesus is in control. And when Jesus is in control, our life is a lot better when he's in control, by the way. And so it teaches us to give him back the steering wheel. I'm not saying that fasting is the one-stop shop and it will work. I am saying it might be the one spiritual discipline you haven't tried that might work. That's good stuff. That's good preaching right there. It's not like, oh, I'm not promising it, but you haven't done it yet. So don't knock the ones you are, right? Ahab and Elijah, I don't know if you caught this, but Elijah tells Ahab, he says, hey, listen, I want you to go eat and drink. Go on with yourself. Go party. Go celebrate. Go entertain. Do what you do as a king. He goes, go do that. And it says in Scripture, Ahab went to eat and drink. And it's, what did Elijah do? He climbed up the mountain and he started praying. We have Ahab who's eating and drinking, and we have Elijah who's refraining to pray. He's climbing up the mountain. Y'all, prayer isn't always glamorous. It, it, yes, sometimes it's desirable, and we love to do it, but sometimes prayer is work. Sometimes when the world is being entertained by everything, the church refrains, and they start to pray. 
I'm just saying that sometimes in your life, you might need to find out what it looks like to abstain from the constant distractions, to turn off the entertainment and say, you know what? This thing is not going to come out by binging another show. This thing's going to come out by praying to a God who can deliver me. I'm going to keep escaping and and binging and doing that. I love Netflix. I love movies. I'm one of the biggest fans. But I have learned if I need freedom in my life, sometimes I have to abstain from entertainment and start praying for God to come through. Have you tried fasting? Listen, fasting has a way of producing freedom that other spiritual disciplines can't. Like, can you say that, Sean? I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Show me. I know. You want to know. Okay. Mar- this is actually in Scripture. I think it's Mark. All right? We're in Mark 9. Let me tell you what's happening. In this moment, a guy has a demon-possessed son. He is throwing himself in the fire. He's acting out, and the, the guy can't heal him. He can't do anything. So he brings him to Jesus' disciples because he's like, they'll do something because Jesus is healing and doing all this. And Jesus' disciples could not set the boy free. So Jesus shows up and says, let me handle it. And he does what Jesus does, right? Delivers the boy and he's absolutely fine. Well, later at that time, they came back to the house, and this is what happened. It said, and when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? I love how they asked it privately, because they were embarrassed. Like, oh, come on in. Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Hold on, what? Jesus said, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting, a.k.a., You might be doing a spiritual discipline that's good for your soul, but certain things that you want deliverance from can only come through a season of fasting. There's some things that you have been going to church, you have been serving, you have been praying, you've been doing everything else you can do. But he says, have you tried fasting? You see, not only do we see this in Jesus, but when the church takes off, we find out that the early church leaders, they would pray and fast for guidance and direction. It might be a 24-hour period. They would restrain from food, and they would pray when they had to elect new elders in the church, when they needed direction on where they were going to go preach the gospel. We see it in Acts 13, and we see it in Acts 14. You can look at it at a later time. But not only does prayer deliver you from something, it also gives you guidance and direction. Listen, I know this is weird for people who might be new to church. I'm not trying to make this weird. Just think about this. (laughs) Have you ever had to do an operation or have you ever had to get an MRI or have you ever had to get checked out? And they said, hey, we need you to come back to get your blood work and do all this. But for 24 hours, we need you to fast. And we're willing to fast to get answers from the doctor. And we're willing to fast to get healing for our soul or for our body. But when the scripture tells you, if you could just take 24 hours, I might give you some answers and some healing that you need. It's not as weird as you might think it's weird. You're like, this is so weird. I don't do that. But the doctor's like, can I need you to fast? Okay, got it. But you come to church and your parents are like, listen, there's some spiritual diseases in your life that fasting can take care of. If you would just say, you know what, I'm going to start practicing this thing called prayer and fasting. It doesn't have to be for four years or 40 days. It might just be a day. It might be a meal. It's just being led, not just in January, but when you come up to a hard decision, when you come up to a direction that you need, when you feel like you're wrestling with something. Every time I preach about fasting, people already go, that's not me. I don't need to do it. That's legalistic. That's fine. Sit with your disease. But the doctor wants you to know that maybe, just maybe, the 24 hours of prayer and fasting will give you the answers you need. It'll give you the healing you need. Not one-stop shop, but what if it works? I got to go to my next point, but I just want to remind you that when I was in Tulsa, I met my wife, who I'm married to, obviously, right now, and I met Liz, and we were dating, and we, I wanted to get engaged. I really cared about her, but I really want the plans and purpose of God in my life, and, and so I wrestle with that. It's my, it's my greatest strength, but it's also my greatest weakness because it can mess with me, and so I feel like I'm supposed to get engaged with her, but I'm like, am I supposed to? Is this God's will? Am I supposed to be doing this? I don't know if I'm supposed to do this, and so it was tormenting to me to where I was like, I don't want to ruin her life. I don't want to ruin what God has for my life. And so I was depressed and down and I could not find clarity. And I just want some, I didn't want my wedding day to be like, am I supposed to do this? You know what I'm saying? And so I just told her, I just need some time to pray and fast. And so I, I did, I stopped eating. And one day turned to two days and turned to three days. And y'all, that's not me. I love food. So just to let you know, I'm, I'm not super holy. Like if I do a fast, I, I started 21 days or just 10 days. I was like, I'm doing liquid. Lasted a half a day. I'm doing Daniel fast. Just being real with you. I'm not trying to say I'm a super prophet here. I'm just saying. And what happened was I started fasting. And in my time of fasting, God led me to a scripture in Isaiah that said, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And I tucked it in. 
two days passed and we were at Victory sitting in a church service. This church is huge. It's got 5,000 seats in the auditorium. During the service, a family friend of the pastor walks on stage and looks at the pastor and says, I need to share something. She walks on stage, and as she walks on stage, she goes, I really feel like I have a word from God because we believe in prophetic words. It's in Scripture. It's all there. It's a spiritual gift. God uses it to build his church. And then she said, there's someone in this room. I don't know who it is, but you need to make a decision. And I feel like God is saying these words. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I broke down <laughs> crying because, and, and from that moment, I had no reservations. I was like, I'm supposed to be with this woman forever. Why? Because God freed me in my mind because he gave me a word in private and then he displayed it in public Amen. from a season of fasting. I'm not saying it's always like that. I'm just saying there's been a lot of things that we're doing as a church, the church starting and all these things have come from prayer and fast. I would tell you, don't make a big decision until you fasted. Don't take the job until you take 24 hours. Don't, don't take the job, maybe a meal. Just pray and ask God and bring people in with you on that. The second thing, what do we do from Elijah's case if we pray and nothing happens? We're going to try fasting. I'm not saying it's going to work, but let's just try it. And let's keep praying. That's the second thing, keep praying. That's the last thing I want to hear when I don't see a prayer that comes through. Just keep praying. It sounds so insensitive. It sounds like, why? Do you not hear what I'm going through? And I'm sure there's pain. I'm sure it's hurt. I'm sure you don't understand, but that seems a little insensitive. Can I tell you, it's easy to pray the first time. It takes a lot of faith to pray the seventh time after seeing no answer prayer. I mean, Elijah prayed the first time. Nothing happened. You know how hard it is to pray on the sixth day? A lot harder than it was on the first day. It's easy. I'm going to pray for this. I'm going to believe for this. It's going to be awesome. And then nothing happens. And it takes greater faith to pray on the sixth day than it did the first. Not saying that you have to have faith to move God's heart, although faith does move God's heart. Not saying that if something bad happened in your life, it's not because you didn't have enough faith. I'm just saying that if faith can move mountains, sometimes praying the fifth day will build something in you like you've never had before. We see this in Elijah's case, right? He prayed the seventh time. But we don't just see this in Elijah's case. Jesus, again, from his principle and from his learning, Matthew 7 through, 7 through 8, he tells this, red letters. Keep on asking, and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For who, everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened persistence moves God's heart. Persistence will move God's heart. But it's hard and it's difficult. Y'all, I don't know how vulnerable I want to get with you. I, I've learned that people can be inspired by like your strengths, but they can connect with you by your weakness. And so I feel like I don't know how real I want to be with you right now because I wrote it down there, be vulnerable. But I also don't want to tell you. Because this week, I did not have a very good parenting moment, and it literally put me in the dumps because I was so frustrated. I was so, I was so mad. I was disappointed with God. Actually, I have, it's hard for me to be disappointed with God because I've seen him so work in my heart, in my life. And, and it's okay if you are disappointed with God. He can handle it. But I finally got to a point where I was, I was disappointed with God. I was upset. And uh, for, con for context, my last 12 to 13 years of following Jesus, I have prayed for God to deliver me from depression, and he has healed me from depression. I have prayed for God to deliver me from addiction, and he has healed me from addiction. I have prayed for God to deliver me from paralyzing anxiety, and he has healed me from paralyzing anxiety. But I've also prayed for God to deliver me from my uncontrolled anger and my malice and my temper, and I'm still wrestling with it. And I'm mad because... The other things affected me and others, but this affects my kids. And if God loves my kids, and I'm praying that God delivers me, I'm like, you want me to parent them right? You want me to lead them right? You don't want them to have emotional scars. You don't want a, a father who's yelling at them and doing these things. You want this, and so your word tells me to be this, and I'm praying for this. Then why won't you do it for me? Oh, am I the only one that has these conversations with God? Oh, can Pastor Sean say that right now? Like, I don't know if I'm coming back to this church because Pastor Sean has issues. We thought you were next to Jesus. 
I was mad. I was sitting on the couch. My wife was over there. I'm like, I'm mad. God, why don't you just show up? I'm like, I'm done going to counseling. I'm done praying. This is stupid. I have spent this many years fighting for this, and here I am still wrestling with this thing. You answered me when I prayed for fire. Where are you when I'm praying for rain? I know some of you are there. So what did we do? (laughs) My wife looked at me while I was complaining. She looked at my eyes. She goes, you need to keep trying. I was like, stop. (laughs) I mean, you feel that? It feels a little insensitive. It almost feels like just keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep asking, keep seeking keep knocking. And she was absolutely right. I need to keep trying. I need to keep asking. I need to keep seeking. I need to keep knocking. And I don't understand why sometimes God makes us keep ask, seeking, and knock, but I know he's a good father, and there's something that he does in us while we're waiting. And I know sometimes he's got to work in us before we get the prayer, because if we got it too soon, we would ruin it. And so he's got to prepare us for it. And there's all these different things that I don't even understand. If we claim to understand why God holds off prayers, we may never understand but he's a good father. And if you can get to the basis that our God is good, then you can leave it in his hands when the prayer is not answered. Maybe your revelation doesn't need to be, why is my prayer not coming through? Maybe the revelation for us today needs to be, God is good despite if my prayer comes through. So she said, keep trying. And when she went in, I had every, the lion in my lungs, I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to pray in those moments. Like, I don't want to pray. This is stupid. It was dumb. I ain't praying. I ain't singing. I'm just going to be mad the rest of my life. That's what I'm going to do. Everyone's going to love me. <laughs> Not going to pastor anymore. I'm just going to come. It's whatever. Just throwing a big pity party. <laughs> and, uh, and I went into my girl's room. They share a room. And I laid next to my daughter, Charlie. And I just started praying. Like, Lord. I apologized to her for raising my voice and screaming, and I started praying. I started asking. I started seeking. I started knocking. And God, and I did receive something. And I did find something, and the door was open to me. And it wasn't that my temper left, and it wasn't that all those things happened, but when I started asking, seeking, and knocking, I received a revelation to remind myself that I'm going to have daughters who are going to see their father who didn't fight pa- or hide passively when this thing showed up, but he fought aggressively to, to knock this thing out for them and, and their family. The second thing is that when I, when I saw, I found a glimpse of hope to keep praying, and the door was open to me, and it was a passion to keep praying for this thing on the sixth time. Because what if you're on the sixth time and you stop praying? Like, how would you pray if you knew this was the seventh time? How would you pray if you knew this was the sixth time? So, if that's you, keep praying. Are you still waiting? (laughs) Are you still in this moment? Maybe you just realized God's good. We'll talk about that next week. But I don't really have a cool illustration or story for you when it comes to keep praying. Like, okay, tell me to keep praying. No, that is it. It's keep praying. And then what's going to happen? I don't know. I just know God asks us to keep ask, keep seeking, keep knocking. And if we always need the results to our obedience, we'll be miserable because our job is obedience and God's job is results. And I'm sorry it hurts. I'm sorry it's difficult. But I can tell you one thing. God's grace will sustain you and it will help you. So we're going to keep, we're going to try fasting. And I don't know if you're here today and you stop praying. If you stop praying, I hope this experience will send you home today and you get back on your knees and say, I'm going to pray for this thing again. I'm going to pray for this child again. I'm going to pray against this addiction again. I'm going to pray for that person again. I'm going to keep praying. Why? I know God answered those prayers, but listen, if God answered the prayer of fire, I'm not going to stop praying for rain. I'm going to try fasting. I'm going to keep praying. The last thing is this. I'm going to start looking. I'm going to start looking. I love this. It said that he didn't see rain, and because he didn't see rain, he said to his servant, which was like an employee at the time, and they're like, oh, the Bible is all about slaves and servants. No, it actually is not. You find that in Scripture. We don't have time for that. But the word servant at this time meant like an employee. He goes, can you go look to see if anything's happening while I'm praying? And he says, he goes out and comes back. He says, nothing, sir. Nothing's happening. And so he goes, go again. Go again. I love this because as Elijah's praying, he's looking. 
I love this because that's, that's his faith. He's saying, I'm praying, but I'm also looking. I'm looking to see the evidence of God. I'm looking to see if he's working in some way. I'm keeping my eyes open to see if there's an open door. I'm not just praying with my eyes closed. I'm praying, keeping my eyes open to what God wants to do. I love this because it's a hope-filled prayer. It's a prayer saying, I'm going to keep praying, and I'm going to keep looking because I know my God comes through. I'm going to keep looking. I wonder, what's so cool about this, is it says on the seventh time, it said that a small cloud, right, the size of a man's hand, literally, Go, this shows up in the sky and he stops praying and he runs off. It wasn't even raining yet, but he saw something that was going to produce rain. I wonder if you're so discouraged <laughs> that your prayer has not come through, but you have missed out on the evidence of small things happening in your life. <laughs> you got to hear what I'm saying right now. This is going to change your life. I wonder if you are missing out because you are not looking for the evidence of God in your life that you actually stop. Can I tell you how you can keep praying? Nothing will keep you praying than when you see a small glimpse of hope. Let me say it this way. My, God really put on my heart the last eight months, well, specifically one person for a few years, to really start praying for specific people to come into a relationship with God like really praying for their heart, really seeing people who don't know Jesus come into a relationship with Jesus. And, and, and one of them is my relative, and uh, another one is a, a, is a relative of mine, and another one is a, you're like, who's your relative, who's your relative? It doesn't matter. But what I'm trying to say is there's that, and then there's a group of guys that I see on a weekly or every other week basis, and I'm praying for these individuals. I'm praying for these people. God's put it on my heart. Well, this first one, this relative I've been praying for years, just praying, Lord, please let this person's heart be turned to you. I want him, I want him and his family to know you. I want this. And as I'm praying, they, they move away. I was like, I want to invite them to church. They move away. And God began to remind me, he's like, Sean, it doesn't need to be you. Just keep praying. They might become in contact with someone where they're at that God will be able. Actually, this could be a good thing that they need to be in this place so that this can happen. So he begins to reignite these things in me. And I'm praying and, you know, I'm getting tired. I'm forgetting about it. And I think I even did forget about it because it, it wasn't happening. And I got this random text from this person recently, and this text said, hey, man, I was on YouTube, and I saw this the other day, and I wanted you to see this. I think you'll like it. And he sent me a sermon clip of a well-famous pastor that I know who's awesome of this encouraging clip. Y'all, when I saw that, I was jacked. I was like, oh, my gosh. I looked at Liz like, babe, you got to see this. She goes, oh, yeah, that's a good word. I'm like, no, it's not about the word. It's a small cloud rising from the sea. <laughs> I forgot to pray, but God gave me a glimpse. I said, I got to keep praying. Why? Because God is working. Some of you want to see the rain pour. He's like, I've given you small clouds. Y'all praying. I was hope that our marriage works. Well, you missed out the cloud when God put your husband or put your, on your husband's heart and he sent you a small little text or he came home and did the dishes. But instead of saying, oh my gosh, there's a small cloud, you said, can you fix this next? <laughs> my women were giving that more. The guys were like, stay calm. Stay calm. <laughs> we're we're going to see like the increase of, like, there's going to be so many more husbands coming next week to this church. It's like, yeah, you get them. Or maybe you're praying for the marriage to work. Right? And you're praying for your kid's attitude to change, and it's not where you want it to be. But you didn't catch the one interaction they had that was positive, and you didn't say anything about it. There's evidence of a small cloud rising. Nothing keeps you praying than when you see these small clouds rising from the sea. Y'all, listen, I still have the temper. I still have it. But when I begin to pray, I realize the evidence is, is not that it's raining. The evidence is the gap between how often I lose uncontrolled anger now, it's actually a lot longer than what it was. And we don't celebrate the gap. We just say, Lord, I want it to rain. But the truth is, is you haven't ran back to that drug for two weeks now. It used to be 24 hours, but now it's been two weeks. So get rid of the drugs again and get back on track. It's a small cloud. God's working. 
We don't celebrate the small clouds. And God's like, if you can just see the small clouds and how I'm working in your life, you'll keep praying. God is so good. We're always looking for the rain, but he'll give you glimpses of the clouds. And he says, if you can see the small clouds, you'll keep praying. Our God may not answer your prayer, but I'm sure he'll walk alongside of you. I'm sure he'll walk alongside of you. I can't imagine... I can't imagine this guy named D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was a evangelist, which means he won people to Christ like Billy Graham. Uh, Moody Bible College. You can do seminary. It's in Chicago. He's a very well-known person in faith. And we, a great movement. He led so many people to Christ. And you may not know this about D.L. Moody, but D.L. Moody actually would keep a list of 100 names in his pockets of friends of his that did not know Jesus. So a lot like what I shared. And he would pray. He wanted these, before he died, he wanted a, these 100 people to know Jesus. And he kept it in his pocket all the time. And he would just pray for them. He prayed for their heart. He, the, word for in, in, the word in scripture, he would intercede, which means he would be an intercessor, which means he would fill that gap. He would pray that God would work on their hearts, that somehow, some way, they would come to know Christ. And it literally said he had 100 people on the list. When Moody died, the time he died, we find out that 96 people on the 100-person list had decided to follow Jesus in his lifetime. I wonder who the one person is in your life that God wants you to reach. And your, if all of us in our lifetime saw 96 people come to Christ, and we have a few hundred people coming to this church, I'm not a mathematician, I preach. You can look it up later. Here's the crazy thing, is that at Moody's funeral, those four people, like 96%, that's awesome. Those four people who did not know Christ, they showed up to his funeral, and the gospel was preached. And by the end of the funeral, all four of them gave their lives to Jesus, fulfilling the whole list. Why do I say this? Please let this sit in your heart. I don't want you to stop praying because, yes, your prayers may be answered while you're living, but my God, what if they're answered when you're dead? Listen, like, don't stop praying because, yes, God is working, but we have no idea how our prayers are going to touch the next generation. We have no idea what's going to touch our grandkids. We have no idea how God's going to move if we're here, if we're not here. So don't stop praying. We have a God who knows, is outside of time. He's outside of space. He's outside of all these things. Don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. Like, Sean, what if I prayed and it didn't work? Like, unanswered prayer. We're going to talk about that next week. Today we're talking about God hasn't answered yet. But maybe you prayed for a loved one to be healed from cancer and it didn't work. We'll, we'll cover that next week. What do we do when we know it was for sure not an answer prayer. We'll take care of that next week. I would love for you to come back. But for this week, some of you just need to maybe try fasting. We'll be done fasting on Wednesday. You can jump in right now. Maybe you can find a time out to do a 24-hour moment and say, God, here's some things I'm laying before you that I want to pray. And maybe you just need to remind you today, I stopped praying for these things. I need to write them down and I need to start praying for them again. Or maybe you just need to start looking and realize God is answering prayer. He's doing it right in front of you. There's joy in places you didn't see it. There's hope in places you didn't see it. So your, your screen time is literally distracting you from what God is doing right in front of you. And it's going to ignite something in you. Start looking. Lord, I just pray in this moment, Father God, for those who feel discouraged or broken, I just pray, Lord, that you are you're with them. Lord, what a word that you put on my heart for today. I don't think it's by accident. Lord, as we sit in this moment, I just pray that you would reignite those prayers. Right now, if you're here and you believe in the Spirit of God, I believe he's going to drop those things back on your heart. Things that you've forgotten about. Things that you need to start praying again for. Things that you were so hurt by or disappointed by. There they are. Yep, it was, that, it was that mindset that you have that you're still dealing with. Yep, it's that insecurity you feel when you're around different people. It's the confidence you're looking for in God. There, there, there's these things popping in your heart right there. 
don't leave this place without writing them on your phone or somewhere so you can begin to pray for those things. And maybe there's some loved ones like D.L. Moody was praying for. It'd be a really good idea to start writing their names down. Y'all, I'm telling you, when you pray for people, God begins to work on hearts. It literally is powerful. So don't just invite and try it in your own strength. Pray for them. Pray for them. And I just pray for everyone in this place, Father God, who might not know you in a way that others do. I pray, Father God, that you would reignite something powerful. Man, there's just such a, there's just a presence in this place. God's doing, I feel like God's saying I'm healing people right now. I'm healing people right now. Man, thank you, Lord, for, we don't deserve your presence, but thank you so much for showing up. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to keep your eyes closed for a second, I just want to take a moment for those who are in the room who don't have a relationship with Jesus. You're like, Sean, how can I start following Jesus? What does it mean to choose Jesus? Well, what it means is we have to stop choosing ourself. Our self leads us into places that God doesn't want us to lead into, and he just loves us so much. And so our sin, it wreaks havoc on our life, but Jesus paid the debt for us. Your works will not make you right. Jesus makes you right. You just got to receive the free gift of grace. What's grace? It's the thing we don't deserve. Jesus paid for your death on the cross. Someone had to die, and Jesus did it for you. And right now, you might be separated from God, but it's his sacrifice that brings you back into God. And the same spirit that lifted Jesus from that grave, it says, will indwell in you and will make you a new person and will continue to transform your life as you keep following Christ. If you're here and you want to make that decision for the first time, we're going to pray a prayer as a church, but I want you to jump in this prayer and mean it with your heart. We'd love for you to make this decision today. Church, can you help me right now? Can you say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus for me. I made the mistakes. You paid for them. I had the debt. You covered it. I want to start a relationship with you. I'm putting my trust in you. I'm giving you my past so I can step into my future. Help me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. With eyes closed right now, right where you are, if you pray that prayer, I'm not going to ask you to do anything else besides this. Lift up your hand over your head. If that was you for the first time, I got a gift for you. Leave that hand up as high as possible. Keep your eyes closed. We're going to bring you a gift that is going to help you with your walk with Christ. It's coming right now. If you're there, put your hands up right now and say, I made that decision. I followed Jesus. I made the best decision of my life. That's you. We see you. I'm so proud of you. Maybe you said that wasn't my first time, but I'm rededicated. I'm recommitted. That's great, too. We're giving you that, we're giving you that gift. Like, Sean, maybe I misheard you. No, you didn't mishear me. God was working on your heart. There's a reason he's working on your heart. That is your gift. That is your Bible. And you made the best decision. We're so glad that you're here. Lord, we thank you so much for what you did today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate all the life change. New life in Christ. Come on, let's let them know we love them.